Hey, this is Ron Coddington from Military Images Magazine. Great to be here on this Monday evening. And thank you for being part of tonight's program. Um, this is our second episode in season one of Research Rabbit Hole. And um, let's get right to it and start, uh, start the sharing. Here we go. I'm going to crank up the PowerPoint and uh, get it started. So here we go. Tonight's episode is titled Anti-Confederate Art. And um, it's based on this particular image. And I should tell you what led me to add it to my collection. The most, one of the most basic reasons to fill a gap in my collection, I don't have many examples of art in the form of cartes de visite, or I should say are published in the form of a carte de visite. And this one showed up recently on a popular auction site. And I thought, this is one that I think I should probably add to the collection. And quite frankly, I didn't go a lot further than that, thinking that this would be a really nice representative example. It's unusual. It's not an image that I can frankly ever recall seeing. So add it to my collection. And uh, here's a close up of what we're seeing here. We obviously have Jefferson Davis and there's uh, cracked glass over his face. There's a frame around him and you've got some notations. If we take a closer look at the face, you can see the shards of glass that are artfully broken around his eyes and his nose creating lines that are coming out from the middle of his face. If we look down a little further to the bottom, you're going to see his name, Honorable Jeff Davis, and it's written in such a way that is reminiscent of prints from that time period. In fact, it reminded me of the kind of printing that you would see on Courier and Ives prints from the time period. So here we've got one of those classic prints. And I believe that this portrait of Jefferson Davis is modeled on the kind of prints that families would be seeing about that time in American history. Now, back to the portrait. We've got again, the bottom Honorable Jefferson Davis and those notes on either side. Those notes are important to the overall concept of what this artist is trying to convey. On one side, you've got a business card or an advertising card. The name of the company, of course, this is a fictitious company, Justice and Company, Dealers in Cordage. Cordage, as you know, is another name for rope. There's an obvious meaning connected with that. And in fine print along the bottom, anywhere north, which is suggesting, of course, above the Mason and Dixon line. On the other side is another note, and this note says, be happy, undertaker. Mr. Happy, the undertaker. And uh, below that, number one, ever ready. So we're learning here that uh, the happy undertaker is gonna be more than pleased at any moment in time to take possession of these remains. Now, at the bottom of this carte de visite is the title, The Neglected Picture. And a bit of a side note here, the fine print below that says, entered according to Act of Congress in the year 1862 by William M. Davis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This notation is an early copyright message. And this copyright information is important to this time, this period in American history, because photographers, the likes of Matthew Brady, <coughs> excuse me, and others are beginning to realize the intellectual rights that are part of the photography that they've taken 
are valuable and they can be pirated and they want legal action to take place if they catch someone doing it. So they're testing the law and it doesn't only apply to photographers. In this case, it applies to the artist who created it. And this of course is William Davis. We'll learn more about him in just a minute. Now, uh, if you didn't get the picture by now, this Jefferson Davis artwork is pretty much what you see here. Uh, here's another metamorphosis print on the hanging of Jefferson Davis, 1865. And so uh, this is not necessarily an original concept, but this artist wanted to share his particular view without perhaps being quite so obvious uh, as this triptych here. Now, just so you're uh, not thinking that this is something that is only anti-Confederate or anti-Jefferson Davis. Take a look at this unmounted albumen print, carte de visite inside, in size of Abraham Lincoln, uh, written across his forehead is idol of abolitionism and some other notes, sort of a menacing looking figure with his mouth open. Now, it's pretty easy to connect the dots from the Civil War to periods more current in time. You've got World War II, for example. These posters, which are in the collection of the Norman Rockwell Museum, uh, are commentary on the Emperor of Japan and the Chancellor of Germany. And of course, this goes right up until today's popular memes. It doesn't matter what side uh, of the argument you're on, there is a meme against you. Now, back to the image. The back mark gives us some interesting information published by Anthony. That would be uh, E and HT, Edwin and Henry Anthony, who are gobbling up lots of rights to print images so that they can sell them in mass quantities to the American public in the carte de visite format. This particular back mark includes additional information that you don't normally see. It says from an original oil painting by William M. Davis. This is the same man who copyrighted the photograph of the artwork on the front. And it also gives us a location William M. Davis of Port Jefferson, Long Island, and the date, 1861. Now, William M. Davis. What do we know about William M. Davis? We know one thing, that he liked to paint in the Trump loy style, which is what we have here. Trump loy is the idea of making a painting that deceives the eye. It's an optical illusion. Here's another example of Trump Loy painting. You've got a bunch of business cards and letters connected uh, or held, I should say, in place by a ribbon against a wooden frame. All of this is painted with the idea of deceiving the eye. Um, and so William M. Davis, we know about that. William Moore Davis, in fact, is his full name. And he was an, op an artist operating in Port Jefferson, Long Island, New York, is born in 1829. So he was in his early 30s when the Civil War began. And he lived a good long life up until 1920. Now, here's a self-portrait of uh, uh, Mr. Davis. And um, what we see here is uh, a background, which is, in fact, Port Jefferson. He loved painting scenes from around the village uh, that, uh, in which he grew up. And so take a look at some of these paintings. You're going to see this bucolic country scene. You've got uh, another scene with the marshes and uh, some smallish lighthouses. You have a ship that's perhaps on a sandbar or the wreck of a ship that has been washed up on the beach. Notice the colors. 
clearly someone who understands art. He's not professionally trained or professionally educated. He's self-taught. And uh, you can see his passion coming through as in these two sailing ships out at sea. So this gives you a little bit of sense of where the artist Davis's uh, passions lie. So when you think about it, it's really quite an interesting change when you go from these beautiful scenes around Long Island with water and ships and sand and trees off in the distance to this hardcore trompe l'oeil of Jefferson Davis in a cracked frame. What, what an amazing transformation for an artist to put down his passion and move in this direction. Now, uh, you recall the back mark says 1861 or a state's 1861 on it. What we know is around March of 1862, so sometime less than a year after he painted this image, it goes on display at a silversmith's um, showroom. This is Ball Black and Company in New York City. And here it appears the painting garners an enormous amount of attention. The attention includes one poet who is inspired to verse. And I'll just read you the first, the first verse. What ails you, Jeff? Hast had a smash? I knew you would, so short of cash. And Jordan's road so hilly, that hanging by a cotton thread, when Cotton King was almost dead, was surely not but silly. I'm not an expert or an authority in poetry, so I can't give you my professional opinion, but it's someone who was motivated clearly to write about what he or she saw. Now, less than a month later, April 4th of 1862, here is the image, the neglected picture, which is on a list of new photographs that are for sale. This is an advertisement in the Philadelphia Inquirer. There's another advertisement that appears in Harper's Weekly from the Anthony's. So we've got some marketing going on. This image is beginning to get some broader play in the North. And it turns out that Davis, in fact, created two more images. Here's one of them. This was painted in March of 1862, the same time that we saw the advertisement that I just shared with you. And this one is called Done Gone. Uh, there is a um, tombstone uh, for secession. Uh, it has a little bit of the taste of trompe l'oeil. You'll see some notes and other, uh, there's a hat um, with an, a hat with the rim, or a, pardon me, the top is broken out, a straw hat with active secession stuff, stuck inside. Clearly an editorial comment, uh, painting in a carte de visite format. Now, apparently Davis painted yet a third image called Hail Columbia, October of 1862. I've yet to find that image. You might know it. I looked around and couldn't find it. But if you know the whereabouts of an image that's titled Hail Columbia with the name William M. Davis, perhaps listed on the copyright on the front or on the back as part of the back mark, I would love to know about it because these three paintings appear to be the only images that uh, he, Davis, painted aside from all the work that he did in Port Jefferson, Long Island. Here's one story that appears in Davis's obituary. So we'll flash forward here to 1920. I haven't been able to verify this particular bit of information, uh, but it's intriguing. I don't think it's true. But here it is, here's the quote. The neglected picture, referring to the carte de visite, was admired by President Lincoln. And after being presented to him, 
hung over his desk in the White House. This picture represented a worn and battered daguerreotype of Jefferson Davis in an old and dilapidated frame. So the description is generally accurate. It's an old dilapidated frame. It's not a daguerreotype. It's clearly an engraving if you buy into the Trump Loy style that Davis was working in. And again, I found no evidence that President Lincoln ever saw it. He may have, and I just haven't found it yet. It could be somewhere in his writings. However, it makes for a great story. Some further research is needed to uh, get a sense of uh, what it was all about. Now, I'm still left with a lingering question. How did this artist, Davis, this man, this talented artist who captured bucolic scenes of his beloved countryside around his home, how did he come to paint this highly charged political commentary about Jefferson Davis? My theory, my working theory is this is an artist who was caught up in the events. He was paying attention to the news like most Americans after secession and Fort Sumter, the rapid series of events that spun off following that, he wanted to make a statement. He wanted to let people know what he thought. And he wasn't going to do that through his beautiful landscapes, as beautiful as they are, celebrating America, the nation's natural beauties. He wasn't going to get there by painting those. So he went off and painted these images to express himself. And if there's only three that existed, and the last one was painted in October 1862, whatever fire he had in his belly, whatever motivated him to stop what he was doing, to stop his natural passion and turn to portraying the Confederacy in the way that he did, it didn't last that long. It really we're talking about maybe a year at most. Maybe he painted one of these paintings every four months and he got it out of his system, at least as far as we know. He may have done some additional sketches. Maybe he did some additional paintings. We don't know. Now, let's flash forward another hundred years to February of 2020. If you do a little searching online, easy enough to find the Long Island Museum of American Art, History and Carriages held a retrospective a century after the work of William M. Davis. Go on YouTube and check it out. You'll find a curator, Jonathan Ollie, who discusses the neglected picture. And he doesn't speculate on Davis's motives like I just did, but he does give some critical context that I think is, is interesting. He says, this, speaking of the painting, drew a lot of no notoriety in New York City, the New York City art scene in the 1860s. And it really established Davis as a painter to follow. In fact, Davis moved to New York City in 1868, about a full three years after the war ended, and set up a studio. He didn't, uh, he didn't stay all that long. Four years later, about 1872, he leaves to go back to his, his home and his passion for painting in Port Jefferson. And that's where he stays until he dies in 1920. The curator, Jonathan Ollie, goes on to say of Davis, he was somebody who was obviously very highly skilled and also willing to take risks and making controversial art at the time. And I think there's something in that. You have an artist who set aside what he was doing to make controversial art, to make a statement. And it wasn't the normal statement of ships in a harbor. He wanted to make a political statement and he did it through his art. He did it through what he was passionate about. And so 
that's Davis's story. Certainly an artist that we don't know much about. We do a little bit more thanks to the exhibit that was put on Long Island. And I recommend you check into it. Oh, uh, there's one other detail that I should mention. While you're watching that YouTube and listening to Jonathan Ollie talk, what you're gonna see on one of those gallery walls is the original, the original Trump Loy painting done by Davis. Here it is. In this case, it's a dilapidated frame, just like was described. The picture just exactly as it looks in the carte de visite, but it's been framed in a, I don't know, could be a frame from the 1920s, perhaps after his death. But here it is, the original of what you see in the carte de visite still survives. So there you have it. The story of William M. Davis, an artist who stepped out of his casual comfort zone for maybe a year and painted some anti-Confederate art. So that's what we have for tonight. I wanna to thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you appreciated this episode. If you subscribe to uh, our Facebook page, Military Images, I really appreciate it. If you'd like to see this episode again and the first episode and future episodes, go to our YouTube channel. And while you're there, subscribe so we can keep track of you and you can keep track of us. Also, all this is happening as a result of Military Images magazine. It's the magazine that I edit and publish part of the collecting community for more than 40 years, Civil War collecting community. If you subscribe, I'm truly thankful, grateful for your support. If you don't and you like this broadcast, you like Civil War photography, check us out. Go to militaryimagesmagazine.com and subscribe. Thank you. Have a great night.